welcome friends this is shailendra again and uh, as you know that we are learning a we are running a three lecture series on basics of deep learning so lecture 1 we covered uh, loss functions and activation function lecture 2 we covered regularization and in lecture 3 we are covering the last uh, thing which uh, which is optimizers so thank thank you for be coming to the class on saturday afternoon after a heavy lunch so i will just share my screen first is it visible screen visible yeah screen is visible So I'll repeat once again. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thank you, students, for joining today on this Saturday afternoon. And uh, I am Shailendra Kadare, as usual, your host for today. And uh, as you know, that we are learning a series on uh, deep learning uh, basics. So in first lecture, so first lecture we covered uh, activation functions and uh, loss functions. Second function, uh, second lecture we covered. Uh, Uh, regularization and uh, third lecture is all about uh, optimizers so it is going to be a short lecture because there is not much uh, to be told on optimizers and uh, optimizers are usually mathematical functions which are very difficult very involved actually so we will not get into mathematical formulas and mathematical details of optimizers we will look into its applied applied part which uh, like uh, which optimizer to use when And uh, was our what are pros and cons of uh, each optimizer? That's what we are going to look after. And uh, as you know, that optimizers we give the we have the option of choosing optimizers at the time of training. Okay. So now I will start the lecture with a question to you. Like, can anybody differentiate for me the difference between activation function, loss function, and optimization function? Can anybody differentiate these three? any definition simple words dr shalesh activation function is the transformation function which is used uh, after each layer in each layer yeah for every neuron we are using yeah. one last yeah. one activation function right yeah and It loss function be, is yeah. yeah loss function loss function is y hat minus uh, y uh, actual and that is uh, that is uh, that that is approximated by some function maybe uh, so that is a loss function and optimizer is nothing but when we are uh, when we are op when we are uh, differentiating that loss function with respect to bias weight uh, bias or weight then that particular function uh, so for that we need a optimizer so That's what is optimizer. Optimizer yeah. basically minimizes loss. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. It is the opti. Does the optimization process? Yes. Okay. Yes. And what is optimization process? Optimization process is to minimize the loss function, right? Yes. So yes. that's where that's what we want in our machine learning training, right? So now, uh, thanks, Dr. Shalesh, for defining it nicely for us. So now we'll start with uh, we'll start with the difference between loss function and optimizer. so activation function i think by now everybody knows what is activation function activation function is like your uh, sigmoid or 10h or your uh, relu or likki relu that's the activation function we are using in forward pass uh, process uh, at every neuron right so it transform your we, we integrate the input and then with the help of activation function we transform it to in a certain way and activation functions are always non linear so why would we choose non linear functions to so that some kind of non linearity is introduced in our neural network and uh, this way neural network can uh, learn complex function complex relationship between y and x that's why we always introduce some kind of non non linearity in uh, so uh, can anybody answer uh, a question answer to me that if i use uh, i don't use a loss function 
or if i use a linear loss function in uh, instead of a non linear loss function if i use a linear loss function so what will happen to my neural network anybody uh, i i think it will fail to converge at uh, uh, no no it so, will not fail to converge it will not fail to converge so instead of non linear of a non linear loss function not sorry sorry i am not putting a non linear activation function if i put what will happen to my neural network my activation function is linear so what will happen to my neural network uh, as in your activation function is non linear but your loss function is something else is that what you are asking no 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 i am asking about uh, sorry i confused actually so i am asking about activation function okay so my question is i just told that uh, we usually put uh, some kind of non linear activation function in every neuron in every layer right yes. so my question now is if instead of non linear act activation function what will happen if i put a linear activation function then in every neuron what will happen to my neural network then it will be a grossly underfitted uh, model yes but why because it won't be able to capture all the uh, Uh, you know all the curves in the right exactly so my neural network will be a simple uh, linear regression model while if i if every equation function is a linear function my neural network will be exactly like a linear regression model okay so any curve or any kind of complex relationship as you said it will not be able to pick up okay so can anybody give me example of uh, lo any any loss function so far we have studied so many loss functions so can anybody give uh, any example of loss function uh, rmse yeah rmse is one loss function in what case we use rmse uh, linear uh, regression linear regression right so it is nothing but uh, why that that loss function is nothing but uh, predicted minus actual whole square right Yeah. Square of square of predicted minus actual whole square, right? So okay. that is nothing but your uh, squared loss, squared error loss, or RMSE, squared error loss, what we call it, right? Yes. So I think uh, it is pretty clear to you now that uh, what is the difference between a difference between an activation function and a loss function. Okay. So now we will take up a difference between a loss function and optimizer. So so first of all, what is loss function? So all, loss function. is the difference between the predicted current or current predicted output and the expected output expected output is nothing is nothing but your ground truth so it is the difference between predicted output minus the uh, ground truth which is expected output that is the distance distance between both both of them okay if uh, predicted value is 0 and expected value is 1 then uh, loss will be very high loss function very high because zero minus one if we do it will be a kind of 100% loss right if uh, predicted value is zero and expected value is also zero then your loss will be zero minus zero there will be no loss zero so that's what we want right so that kind of loss function we want evaluation like loss function is a loss function is a method to ev evaluate how your algorithm models data Loss function is a method to evaluate how your algorithm models data. That is one thing, and a very common example of loss function in linear regression is squared loss. X means squared loss, as we discussed. Now, what is optimizer? Now you have an activation function. With that activation function, you did some feed forward, back feed forward. You did, and uh, you did the back, back propagation. You did the training, complete training of your number of iterations. you did the complete training of your neural network when you then you started using it then you started using neural your neural network you started using neural network and then you got some expect predicted output so with the help difference between predicted and uh, actual output you have the loss function now right so what is your optimization what is your training so in the training you want to minimize the loss function so optimizer is used at the time of training okay so optimizer optimizer is used at the time of training what optimizer does optimizer minimizes the loss function 
I think I confused you in the beginning. But optimizer is used at the time of training, and optimizer is a mathematical function whose 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 job is to minimize the loss function, whose job is to minimize loss. Okay, so uh, like uh, and optimizer uh, minimize the error function. We got it. That optimization is a mathematical function which is dependent on learnable parameters. So learnable parameter means uh, optimizers is defined opti like your optimizer is defined in terms of weights and biases. Optimization e optimization function usually calculate the gradient, first order gradient. So partial derivative, partial derivative of loss function with respect to weights and biases. So what optimization function does? It, it calculates the partial derivative of loss function with, the, with respect to weights and biases. I'll repeat once again, optimization function. Optimization function calculates the gradient or partial derivative of loss function with the help of weights and biases. And once we calculate the weights and biases, weights are modified in the opposite direction of calculated, calculated gradient. If your de partial derivative is positive, then your weight will be weight will be reduced in the negative direction. If your partial derivatives comes out to be negative, then we will uh, increase the weights. Okay. So now let us see the formula. So like like uh, here we have a function, uh, a simple uh, model equation: z is equal to w zero, w one x one plus w two x two up to w one x one. It is the model equation. With the help of this, we calculate loss function. Like say mean squared loss, so z uh, z predicted minus z actual, we do whole square. So it will be in terms of weights and biases, right? It, so loss function will be there in, in terms of weights and biases. We calculate dl by dw. See the expression which is there in in the square. So we we calculate dl by dw. So that squared loss what we calculate uh, uh, dl by dw. So this w is a vector. So each 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 weight we take at a time. So W0, W1, W2, W3 up to Wn, one at a time we take, calculate the partial derivative of loss function with respect to W0, then up, multiply it with a learning rate alpha, and then uh, update the weights. So your uh, W new is equal to W old minus alpha times uh, partial derivative of loss function. This is very simple formula. And uh, what is alpha? So alpha is a learning rate. What does it mean? So whatever is the magnitude of dl by dw, suppose dl by dw comes out to be 10. Uh, so we uh, will not uh, will not uh, will not uh, deduct entire 10 from the w old. We'll take a fraction of it. So if alpha is say 0.1, so 0.1 into 10, it will be 1 actually. So instead of uh, if suppose dl by dw is 10. So alpha into dl by dw will be one. So we'll deduct only one. So how much of partial derivative, how much of the partial derivative we have to deduct from uh, the in the from the old value of weight to get the new weight that is determined by learning rate. And dl by dw is and, and the direction of this will be given by. Whether it will be positive or negative, it will be given by dl by dw. If dl by dw comes out to be positive, then we'll add that amount to w old. And if dl by dw comes out to be uh, negative, then if it comes out to be negative, then we'll add it to w old. And if it comes out to be positive, then we'll deduct it from w old. So, like uh, learning rate is. By learning rate, we, we decide how much of partial derivative we have to take, how much amount of partial derivative we have to take. And partial derivative dl by dw, it gives us the direction, direction under the sign. So now actually, I think I have not defined that great. So I would like one of you to define like uh, this equation, which is there in the square box. I would like you to define one of you to define this equation. I mean, what is learning rate? What is dl by dw? And how weight updation takes place? This whole process, if somebody can decide, somebody can define, it will be nice to other learners. Uh, so maybe I can try. 
Yeah, madam, um, please. So uh, let's say W is the weights uh, which we have to update. Yeah. Uh, uh, which means that we will have to minimize the loss function. So right. now, uh, what we do is we take the uh, gradient where we measure the rate of change of the gradient with respect to some one particular. Uh, uh, yeah, we'll take one by one. So W0 or W1. Yeah, correct. One parameter. So yeah. after we uh, calculate the uh, gradient, we uh, try to minimize the function, uh, loss function. Uh, the alpha is the one that gives the learning rate. That means how much, how much of, uh, how, uh, what kind of steps we need to take, the step size or something like that. Step size, step perfect, yeah. Step so size. Uh, using these two, we update the uh, new weights, weight matrix. Yeah, so weight matrix, so we have to update old, old weight matrix, right? So okay. old matrix, old weight, old weight matrix will be updated with the help of gradient. Gradient is nothing but partial derivative of loss function with respect to one of the parameters. Yeah. So that DL by DW when we calculate the partial derivative, that is a number. Okay, that is a number. And how much of how much of that number we have to take in the operation step will be decided by alpha. So suppose alpha is 0.1. Then uh, only 10% of DL by DW will be used to update the W old. Okay, and then, then there is a sign of DL by DW. So if DL by DW is comes out to be positive, then we will uh, then we will uh, uh, reduce the old weight value. And if DL by DW comes out to be negative, then we'll increase the old value. So in the opposite direction of uh, uh, sign we go, okay. So these are the, the two basic things uh, to in the weight of weight operation process, and it is a very simplified, uh, very simplified. We are uh, in very simplified notations and very simplified equation. We are trying to see what is happening in uh, like uh, like during the back back propagation process. Okay, so we have not defined last function here. So last function is nothing but your mean squared error, your difference between actual minus predicted whole square. Sigma of for all points, sigma of zero, sigma of uh, i is equal to zero to n in bracket predicted minus actual y predicted minus y actual whole square. So that is your loss function. That's what we are trying to minimize here. So I think this process is very clear now. So, so uh, we have discussed that optimization calculates the gradient. We have seen that. And what is gradient is nothing but partial derivative of loss function with, with respect to one of weights or biases. That's what is the gradient. Okay. Then weights are modified in the opposite direction of calculated gradient. If gradient if, if gradient is negative, then uh, uh, then that DL by DW is added. And if that gradient is positive, then DL by DW is deducted from the old way. Okay. So that's how the whole process takes place. So we have now say here eight kinds of uh, eight commonly used uh, optimizers I have listed: gradient descent, stochastic gradient descent, stochastic gradient descent with momentum, mini batch gradient descent, ADA grade, RMS prop, ADA ADA delta, and ADAP gradient. So these eight types of optimizers uh, uh, I have listed here. And each of these are, of course, uh, very complex mathematical functions, which we are not going to into detail of that. But we'll definitely see when to use what. Okay. So whatever, uh, whatever, uh, whatever, whatever process we have seen here, whatever process we have seen here, it is nothing but simple gradient descent. It is nothing but simple gradient descent. You are having a loss function. You are calculating the partial derivative of that loss function with respect to you of one of the weights are biases, and then you have learning rate, multiply the partial derivative with learning rate, and then update the old weights. That is nothing but your simple gradient descent. So simple gradient descent is having uh, a simple, uh, you might have seen this particular curve and formula uh, like uh, uh, n number of times, like uh, when you have to reach your goal is to reach the minima. So minima is nothing but the bottom of the, this U curve, Bottom, bottom is your minima, and at the minima, 
this tangent will be parallel to x axis. That's what you want to achieve. Then uh, for I told you that if gradient is negative, then weights are added. Then 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 the abduction is addition. If weights are positive, abduction is uh, negation. Like we are deducting that partial derivative. That's what is your that's what is your uh, gradient descent process. So there are two challenges with this gradient descent process. And you assume that. Gradient descent is our first uh, out of eight. Gradient descent is our first optimizer and the simplest one. But there are two 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 type of challenges with gradient descent. So what is the first challenge? First challenge is that uh, first challenge is that uh, it uh, gradient descent gets stuck at local minima. Like with gradient descent, a simple gradient descent, we are very likely to uh, very unlikely to strike at local minima. So, like this is a curve. So, this is your uh, this is your loss function. Whatever curve you are seeing here, zigzag curve. This is nothing but your loss function. Okay. So, when you calculate the partial derivative and try to find minima, so your global minima is shown here with the help of that green arrow, big green arrow. So, you have to reach there actually. But with gradient descent, simple gradient descent, you are likely to strike in one of the local minima. So I think we have discussed in uh, one of the earlier lecture that uh, there is something called gradient descent with momentum. So now you see from the left hand side that is a dotted red ball is coming down. Dotted red ball is coming down, and it is it is uh, tending to stuck at the first local minimum where it is shown dotted where we are showing at v u and v we are showing a v on the left hand side. So that are, that's where it is uh, trying to uh, sit. So stuck at it is trying to sit there, but if we provide some kind of velocity or momentum to this ball, uh, assume it is a physical. Phys uh, uh, imagine it as a physical ball. So if the ball is coming very slowly, just just like what happens in a gradient descent, it will try to sit in the first local uh, local minimum. But if we give some kind of energy, velocity, or inertia to this ball, or momentum to this ball, what will happen? It will jump to the other side and then it will get struck at the next minimum. So, what we have done with the help of velocity or inertia, or sorry, velocity or momentum, we have built some kind of inertia in the ball so that it doesn't get struck into local minimum. Okay, so that's why we never use uh, gradient descent generally as it is. We generally use gradient descent with momentum. And you visualize momentum as if it's a, it is a physical momentum. Visualize it like a physical momentum. It works like that only. The value of momentum varies between 0 and 1. 0 means uh, no, no momentum. 1 means maximum momentum. And uh, if you are keeping my momentum uh, very large, then, then it will jump uh, It will jump the minima. And global, even it can jump into the global minima also. So that's where you, with the help of momentum, you are uh, bringing the ball out of uh, the local minimum. That's what is. So we have learnt our first modification to gradient descent, which is nothing but gradient descent with momentum. So this option we have why when we do the training, actually with the tensor flow, when we do the training of our uh, deep learning model, that time we can use this particular uh, optimizer, gradient descent with momentum. And we can set the value of momentum from 0 to 1, uh, depending upon. And this momentum is nothing now but a hyperparameter. You have to, by trial and error, you have to find out the optimal value of momentum. And I think we discussed in our last class that if learning rate, uh, if learning rate is very high, then you have to use low momentum. And if learning rates you are keeping low, then you have to use high momentum. So if you use learning, both learning rate and momentum, you keep high then just zigzag, zigzag ball will move and it will never, uh, it will take very, very big steps and it will never reach your uh, global minimum. So first modification is your gradient descent with momentum. I will advise uh, gradient descent process. You imagine that a ball is sliding the curve and uh, with momentum, we are uh, trying that it is not getting struck at local minimum. That's what is the gradient descent with momentum. Okay, and why we why we give momentum? Very clear. 
we don't want the ball to get struck at global minimum local minimum we want we want to we want it to reach at global minimum okay so this is one first uh, variation now there is uh, there are two curves i have shown here you see here like uh, like if you are not using gradient like simple simple gradient descent if you are using then what can happen like you are uh, assuming it to be a ball simple gradient descent can, can jump around uh, Surface space and if your gradient is very noisy like your sometimes your curve is very noisy sometime your gradient is showing up sometime your gradient is showing down or sometime uh, your gradient is uh, changing direction very quickly then in such conditions if you are not giving momentum then it will not steadily go towards the global minimum but if you provide the momentum then it will uh, the, assuming it to be a ball only so if you program then it will bring bring some kind of inertia to the uh, that ball which is sliding down and it will give a definitive direction to that ball to glide it to the global minimum now the, here are two actual use cases which i am showing with the help of two curves left hand one is gd i have written gd gd is nothing but your simple gradient descent process and right hand side curve which i am showing here the right hand curve which i am showing here is nothing but your uh, uh, gradient descent with momentum now you observe the circle the red circle in uh, circles in both the curves on the bottom of the curve i have drawn two circles first observe the left hand side of the first left hand side curve which is having red circle so there are some uh, steps which are uh, shown uh, taken by that ball which is sliding down so there are these these are some steps shown here so say there are n number of steps here say 20 25 steps are there right and same thing you observe in uh, gradient descent with momentum both balls are reaching at global minima but when you are using gradient descent with momentum the number of steps required are less compared to gradient descent so this is our actual curves so our first curve is plotted uh, with gradient descent as optimizer and second curve is plotted as uh, with gradient descent gradient descent with momentum as optimizer so with gradient descent suppose you are having 25 steps may be possible that gradient descent with momentum you will converge only in 12 steps or 15 steps so always remember that if you are using momentum compared to gradient descent the steps required to reach global minima will be lesser in case of gradient descent with momentum and if you assume that uh, if you are uh, imagine this uh, whole uh, optimization process as a a ball rolling down the curve then it will be very easy for you to imagine uh, what is momentum and what is inertia and what happens by momentum so if momentum is provided to the ball if some kind of speed is provided to a sliding ball then definitely it will build up some inertia to get in a, go, go down right it will build up a inertia so it will the, the, the steps are less and uh, if your gradient is very noisy in that case also it will have a definitive direction because it is having some inertia okay so the number of steps will be required will be less so i take a minute break here so two things i explained gradient descent and gradient descent with momentum so any challenge here in understanding or visualizing these two things Um, one one question on this we have yeah, yeah we have seen the treatment of weights okay so which is nothing but w o minus alpha del l by del w right yeah yeah so what happens to so same learning rate is applied for uh, bias also or see for each uh, each derivative the learning rate can be different depending on optimizer no no what i mean is when we are equation is same this, equation is same no when we are using the giving as a application when we are giving the learning rate then it is uh, only one learning rate we are giving in the in the syntax uh, yeah. Learning, yeah. learning rate alpha is equal to 0.001 and yeah. momentum is uh, this thing so because here we have two terms right one is with respect to bias and one is with respect to the right. this thing so yeah maybe See, uh, the value of learning rate which gets applied to this equation which is there in the box 
it depends okay. on the it depends on the optimizer right some optimizer take different value of learning rate for every weight value and bias value okay and some optimizer may take uh, the same value so i think this about we'll talk about this a bit in more detail in uh, more slides to come but it okay. depends on the optimizer okay okay so i think this this two are very easy to visualize for you now right gradient yeah, descent yeah. and gradient descent with momentum uh, shrutika madam any challenge in uh, visualizing these two processes no sir it is clear it's clear yeah. okay so now next uh, like uh, i'm showing you here next i'm showing you here is and next i'm showing you here is uh, like uh, uh, like three curves i'm showing you here with different different learning rates different different learning rates so uh, curve first curve is uh, very uh, learning rate is very low so ball is sliding very very uh, very slowly ball is sliding towards global minima and you see you see the number of steps are more then just right middle one is just right so first we are taking uh, bigger steps and as we reach towards optima we are reducing the learning rate and we are taking smaller steps but in the third curve which is on the rightmost third curve and that is if you are taking very high learning rate what will happen your ball is which is yellow shown here on the right hand side yellow ball it will miss the global minima and it will jump towards the right hand side other side and then it will jump keep jumping big big step because you are taking very big steps it will never uh, find the global minima so effect of learning rate is very significant on the optimizer this this is what uh, i'm trying to show you pictorially here in these two three curves so now we are getting little more into like uh, optimizers so as i told you there are uh, uh, three optimizers uh, eight optimizers i have told you so two we have seen like uh, gradient descent uh, one and three we have seen gradient descent and third is so uh, gradient descent with momentum okay now here we are talking about one more gradient one more uh, one more uh, one more uh, optimizer which is adam optimizer so i am not getting uh, into detail what is uh, adam optimizer and how does it look like but if you are using adam adam optimizer while uh, in the training if you want to use adam optimizer then it is a very standard optimizer share optimizer which is which is used as a which is accepted as a baseline by the researcher it it combines the benefits of stochastic gradient descent stochastic gradient descent with momentum and rms prop so rms prop is another uh, optimizer and uh, your adam optimizer combines the combines the uh, benefits of stochastic gradient descent with momentum and rms prop so what is stochastic gradient descent we are going to discuss in next slides okay so just for your uh, just take a empirical rule that adam optimizer is a very standard optimizer whenever you are starting your deep learning training you can start with adam adam optimizer and if you feel that result with adam optimizers are not uh, correct then you can go with uh, other optimizers like rms prop or you can go with stochastic gradient descent with momentum take it as a empirical rule let us always start with adam optimizer okay because it uh, it is the best optimizer uh, in all the optimizers and it combines the benefits of many other optimizers it combines them so like we have seen that if your learning rate is constant throughout the training process if you are now come to the learning rate if learning rate is uh, constant throughout the training process then uh, your training process will be smaller Le training process will be smaller as seen in the uh, left hand side left most uh, graph which you see your learning rate is constant so convergence will be very slow another uh, i am giving you another uh, another uh, uh, another uh, empirical rule rms prop optimizer leads to faster convergence to the optimal solution if you feel that uh, after a lot of uh, iterations also uh, your convergence is not reaching with adam or uh, with stochastic gradient descent with momentum 
then you can go for uh, rms optimizer because it least it is known to have faster convergence so two uh, we have uh, seen two uh, we have seen uh, seen two uh, empirical rule one is start with uh, adam optimizer adam optimizer combines the benefit of many other optimizers like uh, stochastic gradient stochastic gradient descent with momentum and rms prop it combines their benefits and a uh, second uh, second or third rule is rms prop optimizer leads to faster gradients faster convergence so rms prop is known for faster convergence and one thing we have learned about the uh, learning rate if learning rate is kept constant throughout then your convergence will be very slow so in beginning like we have learned in in earlier lecture also we start with a higher value of learning rate and as uh, we go towards the optima we go on reducing the value of learning learning rate maybe learning rate can be reduced either exponentially or it can be reduced in a linear rate or you can just divide by 2 divide by 3 all the time and then you can use those so there are several there are several schemes to several ways to reduce your learning rate and uh, which one works there is no hard hard and fast rule you have to try and see okay so now we are we are getting so here we learned eight eight optimizers so we are i think i not listed here so now we are learning one more optimizer which is called batch gradient descent so anybody wants to take a shot what is batch gradient descent anyone you have learned so many uh, so many problems you have solved in deep learning like uh, ann cnn all we used it so what is a deep uh, what is a batch gradient descent anybody wants to take a shot okay so batch gradient descent there are three things batch gradient descent stochastic gradient descent and uh, batch gradient descent stochastic gradient descent and mini batch gradient descent this three type of gradient descents we have batch gradient descents stochastic gradient descent and mini and and uh, mini batch gradient descent we'll see one by one all the three all the three are optimizers and if i am not wrong with any of these optimizers you can use momentum i have to check actually but uh, if i am not wrong with any of these gradient descent methods you can use the momentum also you can use momentum also if i am not wrong okay so we'll validate it sometime later but now let us see what is a batch gradient descent it is one more optimizer we see that uh, in this equation in this equation like uh, we calculate the gradient and then multiply it by learning rate and then update the weight okay so now we have a choice suppose we have 1000 records in our uh, training data 1000 records so what is batch gradient descent is that batch gradient descent we will accumulate uh, will uh, partial derivative you now we'll calculate for all the data points will calculate partial derivative for all the data points full batch 1000 suppose we have total 1000 records we have 1000 records so for all our 1000 records we will uh, calculate the partial derivative with respect to w0 or w1 for all the uh, then we'll take a average and then we'll update the with the help of that we'll update the weight and find out the new weight we'll take the average of 1000 records okay but what happens if you are uh, say here few number of uh, training points you have your number of observation of 100 200 1000 you can use this but what about if you have uh, 1 million uh, 1 million uh, training points in your in your uh, training money 1 million training points suppose you have 1 million observations if you have then just to update weight one one time in one iteration you have to run all the 1 uh, million uh, points and with the calculate the average and with the help of that you have to update one weight or one bias and for that there is another thing you have to keep the all the uh, database into memory all the 1 million points should be there in memory in one, one shot because you are calculating the average for average gradient for all 1 million points so full database of 1 million points should be there in the memory so when your database is very large gradient batch gradient descent is not feasible because 
uh, it is very expensive uh, computationally and uh, it is very slow okay so when data when you are when your uh, number of points are less then you can go for batch gradient descent so what is batch gradient descent we we calculate the gradient for all the uh, all full training full training data if you have 1000 observations we will calculate the partial derivative for all the 1000 points calculate average and do it one updation right so this is batch gradient descent one time second time it comes we will do second time also we will do the same, same thing so obviously if the uh, you are uh, training uh, if your training data the number of observations are very large you cannot use this method so you uh, then we go for either uh, something called uh, stochastic gradient descent or mini batch gradient descent so batch gradient descent is understood so i would like any one of you to repeat what i have told what is batch gradient descent my question is what is batch gradient descent and how it works can anybody repeat please Dr. Shalesh, would you like to repeat? Actually, batch gradient uh, calculates the calculations are performed at all the training data points. For Which all is... the training data points, correct. So, Take an so... average of that and then you do wet wet update or one bias update, right? Yes, yes. So this is how it is. But if if obviously if your number of observations are very large. This is not a feasible method because it is computationally expensive. Why expensive? Because uh, you have to do so many computations to do just one update. And so many, like if there are 50 iterations, then 50 times you have to do that. And another time you need more heavy computer because uh, suppose there are 1 million records, all 1 million, 1 million records should be kept in the memory at the same time. But the advantage is that since we are taking the average over so many points, your uh, curve looks very smooth. You see the curve here. Like uh, your uh, average cost, like average cost is nothing but your uh, some kind of loss function, which you want to reduce. Average cost is nothing but your loss function, which you, some kind of loss function, which you want to reduce. And there are a number of epochs. So with number of epochs, you see the, the cost decreasing. And the curve is very smooth. Why it is smooth? because you are taking average over so many points. So the updates are relatively uniform. Updates are uniform. So curve is smooth. But this batch gradient descent is not feasible for large data sets for the reasons I have explained to you. So what is that? What are the alternatives? Alternatives are two: either use stochastic gradient descent or use mini batch gradient descent. So we'll see both of them what they are. So let us see what like uh, we have already seen the advantages so now we'll let us see a new type of uh, uh, gradient descent method which is stochastic gradient descent so stochastic gradient descent concept is very simple it is also gradient descent but here we keep batch size equal to one suppose you have 1000 training observation points we will do uh, uh, we'll calculate the gradient 1000 1000 times and we'll do updation 1000 times. Means for every record, we'll calculate one derivative, partial derivative of loss function, and we'll update the words once. For every record, we'll do it once. So it is another extreme. Batch, for batch gradient descent, we're doing all, everything at a time. Now this is another extreme. We are taking here one at a time. For every batch, for every, every record, we are doing updation one time. So here, batch size, batch, size, batch size equal to one. Rest, everything is same. Okay. Now, advantage is, depending upon the problem, this can make stochastic gradient descent faster than batch, batch gradient descent. SGD can be faster than batch gradient descent because your uh, updates are very frequent. Anna? And... Uh, one other advantage is frequent updates allow us to have a detailed rate of improvement. But as you can expect that for every for every record you are doing one uh, one updation, so your uh, your average cost uh, cost curve will not be as smooth as you as smooth as you have seen. Your uh, cost curve will not be smooth as you seen in batch descent. It will be very zigzag because in some weight. 
some record uh, derivative will be more another record derivative will be less another will be average so like that you smaller the like uh, updates we are putting to the weight updates which are, are not uniform so your loss loss will be a zigzag curve like this so what is uh, the disadvantage here see this is a zigzag curve and if this kind of zigzag updates are applied to in a, for every record if you are applied this uh, for every record if you are applied updates so uh, your losses are zigzag like sometime uh, your ball will go up sometime your ball will go up, down so it may keep down dancing uh, near the near when when it comes to global minima sometime your loss uh, loss up, update will be up update will be down small big so your ball will be dancing as, as it comes to global minima your ball may be dancing and it may be very difficult for the ball to stay at uh, to reach at global minimum so it may not reach it may never reach the global uh, global minimum in, but in, instead of reaching global minima it will always keep dancing very near to it sometime up and sometime down but it will be never be reaching global minima that is one disadvantage but advantage is it converges faster when data set is large as it causes frequent updates to parameters more frequently so convergence is faster if the data set if you have large data set you can apply this method if your data set is 1 million rows you can apply this method your convergence will be faster and convergence why convergence will be faster because it causes because it is causing very frequent updates to the weights and parameters weights and biases parameters are getting updated very frequently so your convergence will be faster and sgd can be applied for larger data sets sgd can be applied for formal larger data sets so now we have seen two two extremes one is batch batch gradient descent which is once for every once for a complete batch and another is stochastic gradient descent which is one for every record these are two extremes so now let us see something in between something in between which gives combines the advantages of both batch gradient descent and stochastic gradient descent it combines the advantages of both the extremes stochastic gradient descent as well as batch gradient descent both are extremes right so we have something called mini batch gradient descent which combines the advantages of both now as i said it is mini but can can anybody share what is what is meant by mini batch gradient descent what will be the batch size in the case of batch mini batch, mini batch gradient descent dr shailesh what will be the batch size in case of mini batch gradient descent maybe Uh, depending on uh, maybe hundred or two hundred or something. Yeah, so it will neither be complete batch, yeah, and nor it will be one. It will not be two extremes. It will be somewhere in between. Okay, so Dr. Shailesh said maybe hundred, but actual uh, magic number between varies between fifty to two fifty six. Generally, we vary batch size between fifty to two fifty six. Generally, it is not a very hard and fast rule. but generally we take a minimum batch of 50 records and uh, maximum we take a batch of uh, 256 records okay like that we vary uh, the batch size and as it appears mini batch gradient descent means for every batch we accumulate the gradient and then apply once we divide say 1 million uh, suppose you have uh, 1 million records so we have divide we will divide it into batches of 50 Say fifty is a number I have taken. So one million divided by fifty. So this many updates will be applied applied to your parameters. For every batch, update will be applied once. So for fifty records, we will accumulate uh, the partial derivative, take out the average, and then update the parameter. That is oh, that is one update. One update for first batch. Then next batch of fifty records will come. So we'll accumulate uh, we'll accumulate the derivative. Take the average and apply the second update. So for if you have one million records, how many how many updates will be there? One million divided by fifty. That many update will be there. And and this is a uh, this method uh, combines the benefit of uh, like combines the benefit of uh, uh, stochastic gradient descent as well as uh, the batch gradient descent. So what was the advantage of stochastic gradient descent? Gradient descent was very stable. 
the, the curve was very smooth, right? Gradient descent was very stable. Stochastic gradient, what, what is the advantage? It was conversion, convergence is very fast, but this is very unstable. So it combines the effect of both. Like comparatively, now you have a stable kind of uh, stable, you are compared to stochastic gradient, mini batch uh, gradient descent, uh, the curve is like uh, updates are stable and uh, like updates are stable and convergence is also fast. So most common method which we apply in our deep learning, any deep learning problem, the most common method which we apply is nothing but mini batch gradient descent. Mini batch gradient descent. This is what we apply as an optimizer in our all deep learning problem, whether it is ANN, CNN, RNN, whatever. Most commonly applied method is mini batch gradient descent. And it, as I said, there is no thumb up rule that you have to always go for mini batch gradient descent. Go for mini batch gradient descent. If it doesn't work, then go for uh, stochastic. And if your database is small, say 1000 records, 500 records, then you can even go for uh, batch gradient descent. So whatever works, all the three methods, you can choose whatever works. Okay, so this is what all about the mini batch gradient descent and uh, whatever vectorized the um, uh, method, like if you see some derivations in, uh, for, derivations in uh, uh, your uh, feed forward and uh, feed forward and back propagation derivations you will see in books. So they talk about uh, vector, vectorized tensor computations, vectorized tensor computations. So all vectorized tensor computations are nothing but your mini batch gradient descent. For once for a batch, they are done. Uh, one, the, once all the computations are done, once for a batch. So that batch is a three-dimensional vector, three-dimensional tensor. And for once for a batch, you do uh, that uh, all the computations you do. And, one, and this vectorization, vectorized computation which you see, this vectorization computation, vectorized computations can be very easily implemented using NumPy. Suppose you are not using TensorFlow, you are using, uh, you are from scratch, you are computing feed forward or back propagation. You can directly use uh, NumPy procedures for the, like complete batch you can complete at time with the help of NumPy procedures, NumPy formulas. With the help of NumPy package, you can directly use uh, for a complete batch, you can do the computations. So that's where, uh, so most of the time we do this mini batch only. And then uh, mini batch works faster also, and it is comparatively stable compared to uh, stochastic gradient descent. Then uh, Adam optimizer. So I'm uh, taken Adam as a, Adam as a Adam optimizer I have taken because it is uh, one of the most uh, widely used optimizer. And Adam is uh, adopted as a benchmark for deep learning papers, like researchers know. So they use Adam as a benchmark. Okay. So that's why I have used here. And Adam optimizer inherit features of both Adagrad and RMS prop. We are not going into detail what is Adagrad and RMS prop, but Adam combines the effect uh, benefits of Adagrad as well as RMS prop. Then uh, that this is a simple plot uh, with the same problem plotted 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 with uh, different different uh, different different optimizer. So SGD SGD with momentum RMS prop Adam Adagrad and Ada Delta. So Ada Delta is another. Uh, optimizer which uh, we have not discussed in detail so the what author is trying to show here is that uh, adam is uh, if you see the color, color color notation if you see the color notation adam is green adam is green right so green uh, green curve is shown on the top one of the base performance that's what uh, is trying to that's what uh, is being shown here with the help of this plot. For the same plot, same plots, we have used uh, different different optimizers for training, and uh, we can see that the best performer is uh, Adam. And uh, you see the SJD with the momentum, and all SJD momentum is a blue line, which is the bottom most. Is not performing that great. 
So here is the accuracy. Here is the accuracy on the right hand side, and here are the number of epochs. So accuracy on the y-axis, number of epochs on the x-axis. So accuracy. So see, you see, at a like uh, SGD and SGD with momentum are not performing that great. Adam is performing great. So we should always start with Adam. And if you are not satisfied with the result, use other ones. So then you will ask me a question like, if Adam is the best, then why not always use Adam? No, it doesn't work like that. It depends on the uh, problem requirement and the type of data you have. So like, uh, you never know that what kind of problem I have and what kind of data I have. You do never know that, right? So you will never know. When you start, you will never know that which kind of optimizer to use. So it is basically trial and error. Because seeing a problem, seeing a data, you cannot say that Adam is required or HGD with momentum is required or RMS prop is required or Ada grid is required. Looking at data, you cannot decide. Looking at problem also, you cannot decide. So what, what decides? It is a basically trial and error. And you can use this as a, if you are using a, hyper, if you are using automatic hyperparameter, uh, uh, automatic hyperparameter uh, optimization, then you can use this as one of the uh, hyperparameter. You can give a multiple choice of uh, optimizer. And uh, if you, suppose you are trying grid search. So in grid search, one of, one of your hyperparameter will be uh, your optimizer. You can use three, four type of optimizers and uh, let your grid search uh, work on them or your Bayesian search work on them or your random search, uh, random search work on them. If you are doing that. So this you can either you can do it by trial and error or you can do it by automated uh, automated uh, upper parameter optimization and you treat this as a uh, your optimizer itself you can treat it as a uh, hyper parameter. That's what you can do. So Adam like a couple of things I want to show like Adam tends to focus on faster computation time like advantage of Adam is faster computation time. Stochastic descent, stochastic gradient SGD, stochastic gradient descent focuses on data points. Like each data point will run once, right? SGD, stochastic gradient descent will run, will update parameter once for every point. So generalization is better with the help of SGD. Generalization, like you get a better model with the help of SGD, better generalized model you get with the help of SGD. But with the help of Adam, you get faster computation time. HGD gives you a more generalized and better model, but computation speed is uh, like uh, low compared to Adam. So that's where you have uh, more some disadvantages and advantages, disadvantages. Like uh, uh, you cannot use Adam always, you cannot use SGD always, you cannot use with momentum always. So it is all the time trial and error you have to use and to get the optimum results. And to, for any problem you are having in the field, you are usually having sufficient time to try out uh, different kind of uh, optimizer. optimizers. You have time. But if you don't have time, then always go for uh, RMS Pro. Sorry, Adam. Adam, you go for Adam. And if you are not satisfied with the result, then go for other optimizers. So I think this is all about uh, TensorFlow Keras. I think by now, this time you are very much aware with what is TensorFlow, what is Keras. So I will repeat what we have learned today. I'm done with the class. I, I'll repeat what we have done. So first of all, we have learned the difference between loss function and optimizer. Loss function, everybody knows. And optimizer minimizes the clock function, right? And so because optimizer minimizes loss function, optimizer also uh, like uh, it, uh, like uh, what is optimization? Optimization is nothing but calculation of first order derivative with respect to weights and biases. What is uh, then, okay, so that's how you have to for, for back and during the back propagation process, you update your uh, parameters, which is weights and biases. Then you have these eight now eight types of uh, optimizers, which I said uh, uh, Adam is most promising, but all the time he is not a magic key. If it doesn't work, it doesn't give proper result. Use others. 
then you your first and very basic is uh, gradient descent which you are using in case of linear regression so gradient descent uh, you are using in linear regression plain gradient descent in which learning rate also is not changed learning rate is constant throughout so it has uh, now this this is the your learning this is your uh, linear regression equation z is equal to w0 w1 x1 plus w2 x2 up to w1 x1 this is nothing but your linear regression equation and uh, how words are updated so w new is equal to w old minus learning rate alpha times partial derivative of loss function and how words are double up updated in the opposite direction of derivative if derivative is negative then then weights are updated in positive direction and if derivative is positive then weights are updated in negative direction and why we do like that we we are, we we are we we want to achieve uh, we want to traverse towards uh, global minima we want to traverse towards global minima that is why and the direction is divided by the the director is direction is the decided by the negative of the derivative the negative of the derivative our direction of our traverse our we are traveling downwards right our ball is traveling downward so that downward travel is decided by the direction is always decided by the negative of the derivative if derivative is positive we will go in negative direction and uh, if derivative is negative we will go in positive direction that's how simple formula and this is we have shown in the case of linear regression but as you are aware in the case of neural network it will be very complex first challenge with the help of uh, gradient descent is that it always uh, structs at uh, try to structs at local minima so what is the solution so in don't use gradient descent use gradient descent with momentum so you know what is momentum in if you use gradient descent with momentum you will take fewer number of step to converge compared to plain gradient descent then uh, learning rate if learning rate is too low learning rate is just right and learning rate is uh, very high you know the effect of that so learning rate is just right means to start with take bigger steps and as you reach your uh, minima take a smaller smaller steps so you know what happen with two, if two two small uh, steps you are taking or very very small learning rate you are keeping you will take lot of time for con uh, convergence and if you are taking two very big steps you will never reach minima these are the implications then batch gradient descent it is a optimizer in which for a complete batch like suppose you have 1 million 1 uh, 1 million observation points so you will calculate the derivative for all 1 million points calculate the average of that and for 1 million point uh, 1 million points you will uh, update the you will update the par parameters only once parameter means weight and bias one for all the 1 million run when you will do for when you will run through all the 1 million points then only one update you will do so there are 50 iteration so 50 times you will run through all million one million points there are 50 iterations you have decided then 50 times you have to run through all uh, 1 million points so it is very expensive computationally very expensive but advantage is that since we are averaging over a large number of points it is very stable it is very stable but and it obviously it cannot be applied for very large uh, data sets so what is the solution solution is uh, solution is nothing but solution is your another extreme is the solution stochastic gradient descent stochastic gradient descent means we take only one uh, record at a time and for every record we will calculate the partial derivative and do the parameter updation once for every record but for, for if as we are doing for every record it will be very unstable zigzag type of curve why because for every record we some for some record update amount will be less for some some record update amount will be more so it is very uncertain we are not averaging out for uh, something uh, 10 15 record we are not averaging out here for every record we are doing so it is very difficult to reach minima with the help of uh, uh, sgd but sgd uh, with sgd convergence is faster convergence is faster and you can apply sgd to uh, stochastic gradient descent to larger data set then what is the way out here way out is to go in between don't take full batch or don't take only single record use something in between so we are taking something in between 50 to 256 
Suppose I have one million records. I'll divide. Or I'll take divide one million records into a batch of fifty. So one million divided by fifty. That many number of times I will update the parameters. And the mini batch is the is what we are supposed to use most of the time when you are doing the training. Okay, so it combines the advantages of gradient uh, gradient descent and stochastic gradient descent. Both combines the advantages and it is faster also. And most of the vectorized computation and tensor computations which you see in books, they are done for uh, mini batch gradient descent. Then uh, this is done. Then uh, Adam optimizer. Adam optimizer is Go to optimizer. It is a benchmark optimizer for uh, by, accepted by the researcher, and it combined in it. It combines the benefit of Ada grad and RMS prom. But all the time you cannot go with and convergence is faster with the help of Adam. But all the time you cannot go for uh, Adam. If Adam doesn't work, go for Adam first time. If it doesn't give a proper result, then use either Ada grad, RMS prom, or some other optimizers based on. Your experience. Then uh, this is the curve which, uh, like, uh, one of the researcher has drawn, and for the same problem they have used different different optimizers, and you can see that uh, Adam optimizer on the top, so accuracy is the best, and uh, con uh, like, and the conversion also is very stable with the help of Adam optimizer, and uh, all the time you cannot use uh, Adam optimizer. With uh, Adam optimizer, you will get faster computation time. But with uh, stochastic gradient descent, since we are working one for each, we are updating one for each uh, record. You have better generalization, but computation speed will be very less with the help of HGD. So these are the different aspects of uh, uh, different aspects of optimizer. So basically, when if you are given a when you are given a data set and a problem to work with. You looking at the data set and looking at the problem, you can never decide which optimizer you have to use. So start with Adam, good result, well and good. And if you don't get good result, use other uh, optimizers. And uh, and uh, as I said, the optimizer itself can be a hyperparameter in uh, your uh, automated hyperparameter process. Suppose you are using grid search, so optimizer itself can be one. Uh, you are having nice computers, then put all the eight optimizers or nine optimizers, whatever we have studied. Eight optimizers we have already studied. Then here two more are given: HGD with momentum and Ada delta. So put 10, 12 optimizers at a time and ask computer to compute everything from that. If you have nice computing, nice computing power available, use all the 12. As, use this as upper parameter and see which is giving best result. Otherwise, if you are uh, having very less computation power. Then uh, you start with Adam. Then uh, you should have some experience also with every optimizer. So with the, with more and more problem will solve, your experience with optimizer will improve. So based on that, in few fewer iterations, you will be able to reach optimum optimum results. So experience matter here matters here. So that's all for uh, my today's lecture. And uh, if anybody has any questions here, I'll stop here. So it was mainly on optimizers and uh, mainly the his entire lecture was on optimizers only. So basically, you should need to know the difference between a batch gradient descent, stochastic gradient descent, and mini batch gradient descent. It is very confusing. You should know, but the difference is very, very clear. Batch gradient descent means, uh, sorry, gradient descent means once for complete uh, data set. Stochastic gradient descent means one for uh, every record. And a mini batch means one for a mini batch. Updation, that is about updation, updating the frequency of updating the parameters. So these, this difference you should know. Apart from that, you have uh, uh, Adam, which is uh, accepted as a benchmark. And then you have RMS prop, Ada Delta. So other, other ones are there, which uh, you can uh, use for your trial and error. So that's how I had planned my lecture today. So I think we are covered in a comfortable time. So you have any questions? Shutika madam, Malini madam, Shalit doctor? Yeah, one question. So all these, when we are playing with, because some very little experience with these optimizers, but when we are playing with these optimizers, then 
learning rate should be kept same uh, across the optimizers or because what i have no, seen no 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 hey, no learning rate i have not uh, explained you i think i think learning rate i think uh, because, yeah uh, see here uh, regarding learning rate Adam optimizer updates the learning rate for each of for each network network rate individually. No, so some I what I have seen is some are working well with the finer value, um, means lower values of learning, maybe ten to the power minus three. But if I am changing the optimizers uh, across for the same problem, then some requires a lower learning rate. Some requires uh, larger. Yeah, so it's all it's all trial and error was. It's all trial and error. The rule of thumb is that you start with a higher learning rate, yeah. and uh, most commonly, what we do, we reduce the learning rate exponentially as with uh, as we reach uh, trying to reach global minima. And this scheme you keep constant for all optimizers. For every mild optimizer, you use first a bigger learning rate, higher learning rate, and then reduce it uses you reduce it exponentially. That's what is done most commonly, but if that is the exponentially reduction is not working, then you have, you can reduce it either linearly, or you can divide in every step. You can divide by two, divide by three, divide by four, like that. You can reduce. But when you are trying different different optimizer, you are changing the optimizer optimizer when you are changing. Mm. Don't uh, change the learning rate scheme. Suppose for uh, you use the Adam optimizer and kept uh, x learning rate and reduced it up exponentially. So use the same scheme. Same policy, same scheme for all the optimizers. Mm. Okay. Like whatever scheme you are adopting from one optimizer, keep it constant for uh, all the optimizers. And it's okay. all, uh, it's nothing uh, mathematical, it's nothing solid rule about uh, like uh, which kind of optimizer requires, which kind of learning rate. All of it depends on the data. Whatever data set you have, all of that depends on that. So it's all uh, more or less your experience and your trial and error with that. So it's okay. all is data specific, data data set specific. So still that whatever we have solved, maybe very five, six problems only we solved. But there we used a constant learning rate. Right? But uh, if any solved examples are available with variable learning rate or that scheme, then it will be very useful. Yeah, no, nobody takes constant learning rate. It is not uh, recommended. Generally, learning rates are taken uh, reduction in reducing. First, uh, you keep high, then you exponentially re reduce it. So nobody takes a constant learning rate. Okay. So better practice sir, is to take variable learning rate. Sir, learning rate will won't be the output of out, out optimizer function. No, learning rate is one of the hyperparameter which we are applying from outside. Learning rate will not be output, uh, will not be the outcome of uh, optimizer, madam. It will be, has to be supplied from outside. It's a hyperparameter of neural network. It's a hyperparameter and all hyperparameter we have to supply from outside, right? So it is also a hyperparameter which you have to supply from outside. So then in the slides, what was written? What is the output of that optimizer function? Optimizer function will minimize your loss function. See, yes, madam, sir, that alpha, alpha that we saw, w nu is equal to w. Wait, wait, I will go alpha, to that equation. Yeah. I will go to that equation. Yeah, this equation, yeah. So, so I, madam, I, uh, I, I got your question. The output of optimizer will be, it will give you uh, constant weight and bias. Updated weights and biases it will give you. When you do optimization process, okay. it will give you weights and biases. Okay. Your neural network parameters are there, no? weights and biases, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's yeah. what will define your neural network, right? Yeah. So using, when you reach convergence with the help of, uh, when you reach convergence with the help of uh, any optimizer, then your weights and biases will no longer change with iterations. Suppose 100 iteration, you got some value of weights and biases. Yeah. And suppose convergence has reached, you have reached global minima. Then if you one twenty more iteration also if you re, uh, put your weights value of your weights and biases will not get changed. So yeah, final outcome good. of uh, final outcome of your optimizer is your final value of weights and biases. Got it, man? Yeah. 
that's what you get and uh, learn, uh, learning rate is only a tool to reach there the learning rate anyway we are not using finally what we'll use we'll use only weights and biases because that's only define our uh, neural network right learning rate is only a tool a tool means it is a hyper parameter which helps us to reach our final values of weights and biases got it yeah so what is the process in in optimization we are minimizing the loss function that is the process and in the process what we are getting output is final value of weights and biases okay that is the output okay. and so that happens then, during the back propagation so internally that alpha that is the learning rate gets adjusted in that optimization process and yeah that rate. we have to supply from outside we have to give the from outside okay okay and once we have the final value of weights and biases we don't need then this learning rate is not useful at all madam mm -hmm. because what you want you want only the final value of weights and biases right mm -hmm. once you have that once convergence is reached your learning rate is useless for us that is not important mm -hmm. because that doesn't uh, come in the equation of uh, your uh, model mm -hmm. hyper parameters never come in the equation of the model right yeah. hyper parameters are always supplied from outside Mm -hmm. and uh, they help us to reach convergence they help, they help us to reach a, a convergence uh, like uh, a constant model equation once we yeah. have the model equation learning rate is not at all useful yeah so that i understood sir only thing i uh, had a confusion that this uh, learning rate is the output of optimal no 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 no, no 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 it is a hyper matter for you understand catalyst in a chemical reaction yeah yeah catalyst in a chemical reaction hmm. so catalyst is a catalyst is a substance which uh, helps us to complete the chemical reaction hmm. but it is not the output of chemical reaction yeah, right yeah, yeah. it remains yeah, unchanged hmm. so it is a catalyst you can say it a kind of catalyst hmm. we supply it from outside we vary we vary some we reduce keep on reducing it supply from outside and once we have all the value of weights and biases we throw it away we don't need it mm. it is not useful because it is not the part of our model equation yeah. hyper parameters are never part of model equation okay sir our parameters which we are interested in our weights and biases that's what we are interested in all other hyper parameters which is all other hyper parameters Our way to get our weights and biases. Once we have our final value of weights and biases, all other hyper hyper parameters are useless. Mm -hmm. We just want the model equation. Model equation is nothing but uh, weights and biases. That's all. Yeah. So we don't need uh, any of the hyper parameter after that. It is just for the optimization process. any more question dr shalesh um, uh, malini madam you are not asked any question no question sir is it understood madam properly i have uh, understood maybe i need to actually put it into practice and then see yeah yeah you have to put it into practice you have to put it into practice practice only will teach you madam this is just a, your first introduction with optimizers practice only will make you perfect there is no other alternative to practice and so on okay so if no question then better we close is there uh, uh, are there any other topics in deep learning that you are you will be taking uh, madam to? this uh, mostly over okay after that uh, some there is something called transfer learning okay okay which makes your uh, deep learning very easy where you use ready made models you are using to so be ready made models which are developed by microsoft google of the world that you are using uh, in your own analysis okay so that is called transfer learning so that we have to cover uh, next week